In this video, we're going to be looking at the Renaissance, which is the rebirth of art and learning. A very, very exciting time, especially compared to a lot of the tragic things that happened during the Middle Ages. As we go through this lesson, take a look at the notes guide that you received either in class or you can download directly from Moodle and make sure to be filling out your ideas and thoughts as we go along. So first of all, let's think about the word Renaissance. When most of you think of the Renaissance, uh, I think the thing that comes most easily to mind is the Renaissance Fair. And maybe some of you have even gone to it. And the Renaissance Fair, if you've been there, has a lot of jousting, a lot of turkey legs, a lot of kings and queens and people dressed up in all this, this garb. And really, the, the mentality they're trying to get at there is not as much Renaissance as it actually is Middle Ages, which I think is kind of interesting. It's kind of a misnomer, if you will. Um, what we're going to be looking at for the Renaissance has much more to do with the pictures on the right-hand side of the screen. Much more to do with art and learning and printing presses and poetry and all kinds of things that are much more cultural um, in a different way, I guess, than uh, what you might think with the Renaissance Fair. Now, the Renaissance has two major sections, the Italian Renaissance and the Northern Renaissance. When most people say Renaissance, they think Italian Renaissance. Uh, the focus there is on sculpture and painting and it has people like Da Vinci and Michelangelo and anyone else that happened to be a Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle back in the early 90s. But the Northern Renaissance is also important and we'll talk about that one as well. That one has more of a focus on writing and about changing society into a better place. And that's where you're going to see people like Shakespeare at the very end of the Northern Renaissance. So why do we have a Renaissance that happens at all? Let's do a little backdrop on Italy. We said that's where the Italian Renaissance is. And we saw the fall of the Roman Empire got swept over again and again. There's a lot of tragedy and a lot of things happening there. But a big turning point is the Crusades. At the Crusades, there are thousands and thousands of people going through Italy. And Italy ends up being a hub for a lot of trade. It's a bunch of big cities that spring up. You can see here, they're all divided up here, like Florence and Siena. Uh, Venice has a huge port. And these city-states become super wealthy. Lots and lots of merchants. But... As you might remember from the Black Death, those merchant cities end up being some of the hardest hit when the plague comes. So all of a sudden, you have a bunch of people in the city. They, a lot of them get wiped out. And what gets wiped out even more than the people is the need for merchants. Uh, once the plague strikes, I mean, basically, it's a big recession in the market. Nobody needs goods. They cut off all the trade routes. And all of a sudden, you have all these people and all their sons and relatives and things like that that don't need to be merchants anymore. Now they can actually do something else. And some of them turn to art, which is part of the reason why this ends up becoming a center of cultural rebirth. One of the major things we're going to do in this lesson is look at art. Uh, you're going to see a, a very dramatic change between medieval art and uh, Renaissance art. And hopefully you'll get a feel for how the, um, the different pieces worked here. So as we go through these, I want you to take a minute and pause the video, write down your thoughts about what each piece means, and uh, then we'll talk about it. So here's the first piece. So take a look at the picture, pause the video for a second, and write down what you think this piece is talking about and what do you notice. Okay, so... Lots of things going on here. Some of you might have commented on the colors. It's very gold. Uh, you might have noticed uh, that it's, you know, maybe a mother and, and son. Uh, some of you might have noticed uh, several other things. Uh, perhaps you notice that it's religious. Maybe you focused on these little halos here, or what artists are going to call a nimbus, indicating that these figures are perhaps holy. And in this case, this is a picture of Mary and Jesus. It's a painting called the Madonna and Child. This is one of the major themes in medieval art because, as we said, the church is really important in the Middle Ages. So, of course, the artwork would be important. The artwork would probably dominate right around what they're thinking about. So Mary and Jesus makes sense, Madonna and Child. As we mentioned, the halos or the, the nimbus around each one of them is really important. As far as the artistic style, not the most realistic picture in this case. Um, it's pretty flat, pretty... Uh, 2D, if you will. Uh, there's not a lot of nature. There's no real background. There's no horizon line. They're just sort of there. They are the focus, and that's important. And then maybe some of you noticed Jesus' face here looks kind of like an old man. I think he has a receding hairline here, which is a little bit worrisome for someone that's probably only about two years old. So those are a few features that you might have noticed. Let's look at another picture. 
Pause the video for a second and write down what do you notice in this picture? What is going on? Okay, you may have noticed that the theme here is also religious. Maybe you noticed that what he looks like he's wearing here is like a monk's robe, and it is. Um, some of you may have also noticed that uh, he has some traditional, like the, the tonsure haircut we're going to see here, where they shave the top of their heads. You may have noticed that. Um, this particular monk is a man named Francis of Assisi, which I wouldn't expect you to know off the top of your head, so don't worry. And each one of these pictures, this is him in the middle, each one of these pictures along the side is a story from his life. Different stories about how he lived his life and different things he did over the course of his career. For example, in this picture, uh, we have little Francis of Assisi here, and he's actually talking to a, a big bush that's full of birds, various birds. And the story was that he wanted to uh, talk so much about uh, his beliefs to everybody that when he couldn't find new people to talk to, he would even share it with the animals. Uh, and as I mentioned here, you can see the robes, the tonsure haircut, and the panels are about his life. Again, still a pretty flat style. There's a little bit more nature, although definitely not realistic. Um, even if you look here at the birds, if you can look really closely, they're all basically the same bird, just slightly different sizes, but all facing the same direction and not too creative. Uh, so that's one, one picture of St. Francis of Assisi. And this is, again, a medieval picture. It's very focused on him. It's very focused on his life. It's not really focused on being beautiful. It's more didactic or meant for teaching. That's what didactic means. Okay, how is this picture different or how is it similar? Pause the video for a minute and write down your thoughts. Okay, so there's some things that are similar and maybe you noted that it was, there's a, another monk here in the middle of the picture and that would be true. Uh, in fact, it's a picture again about St. Francis of Assisi, the same guy. But as you notice, the picture is very different from the first one. This one has a lot of nature in it. It has, you know, three dimensions. You can see a background. In fact, the background here is really quite remarkable. Um, a lot of detail. Uh, this is one of those paintings that's a huge wall painting. It's not just a tiny little one. Um, in fact, there's enough detail that I've heard that if you look at it up close, this donkey right here has enough detail that it's, you can see it flicking away flies with its tail. It's that small, that detailed. Um, and in fact, this painting is not so much about St. Francis of Assisi. He's just the excuse for the painting. Um, and this is a Renaissance piece. It's still paying homage to the fact that St. Francis of Assisi is an important fe figure, but it's not about him. It's more about beauty. It's more about truth. That's what's important to Renaissance artists. So what is the focus of the Renaissance? We said it's a rebirth of art and learning, and there's this huge focus on going back to the sources. Uh, what sources are they talking about? Greek and Roman sources. They want to go back to that Greek heritage, that Roman heritage that they thought was pretty awesome. And forget about those thousand years in the middle where there was a lot of bloodshed and plague and stuff that they would rather forget. So one guy that ends up doing a big, uh, or end up, ends up playing a big role in this is a guy named Petrarch who actually started to go through ancient texts. And there's some interesting stories about how he and his friends used to potentially, according to some sources, grave rob various old tombs to try to find books, which I think is just kind of awesome. It's Indiana Jones-ish, if you will. So if you look at this picture right here, um, this is a sculpture. And you might say, what does it look like? And you might say, well, it kind of looks like he's Greek or Roman. He's got that haircut. He's got this breastplate that I'm not sure if it's a breastplate or if it's actually his chest. It's a little bit confusing. But this doesn't look like someone that'd be medieval, someone that would be coming out of the Middle Ages. It definitely looks Greco-Roman. And this was uh, actually a piece that was made by Michelangelo for the powerful family in charge of Florence named the uh, de Medici's who wanted a sculpture made of one of their relatives. And as it says here, uh, he sculpted the whole thing. He got it all done. And he was uh, working for the family. They were patrons of his. And in the end, he pulls off the sheet from on top of Michelangelo. And they're like, that doesn't look like our uncle. And he says, I thought you wanted to look like a great man. Um, you know, does it, do you want to look like a, your uncle or a great man? And the idea was that if you were great, you were Roman. So 
not focusing on what people actually look like, but to be great, you had to tie back to those old, old sources. So Renaissance men, uh, L'Umo Universale, uh, the universal man, was someone in the Renaissance that could do a little bit of everything, a jack of all trades. Uh, but they were definitely master of some of them as well. So they had a lot of skills and interests in different fields. They wouldn't just be a painter. They might be a painter and an inventor or a sculptor and a writer. All these different things. They were good at multiple different things. A couple of them that you should be aware of. Um, one is a guy named Raphael. Uh, he does a lot of painting especially, um, although he also works in some other mediums. Uh, one of his famous paintings here is called School of Athens, which is actually in the Vatican. And uh, it's a painting of a bunch of Greek people, which should seem weird to you because in here we have in the center, we have Plato and Aristotle who were Greek philosophers who had ideas about things pre-Christianity. But this painting is in the Vatican where the Pope lives. It's, it's really odd. Um, the other thing I think is interesting about him is the idea that he actually thought that he himself was important enough to paint a painting, not just to sign his paintings, but to paint a picture of himself. This is his impression of himself, thinking that people someday might want to know what he looks like. This is a major change. Uh, in the Middle Ages, you would paint and paint and paint, and you would never know who did it. Now they're not just signing it. They're actually saying that who, who they are is important. Michelangelo, uh, you might know from especially the, the Sistine Chapel. You've probably seen this picture here of God and Adam. It's on the top of the ceiling here. It's actually really busy. Um, but he did a lot of sculpture. Um, as well, this is something called the Pieta. It's carved out of a single piece of marble, which is incredible. Um, but he worked in multiple mediums as well. Leonardo da Vinci, uh, most famous probably for his Mona Lisa, but he also is really renowned as an inventor, creating things like a helicopter, um, which probably would have almost worked, um, at least in its basic premise. So. We've looked a lot at the Italian Renaissance and how that's really focused on beauty and sculpture and art. And at the beginning, we mentioned that the Northern Renaissance has a little bit of a different feel. It's much more into writing. Um, there is some artwork, but there's a big influence of religion, this idea of Christian humanists. There are people that think that humans are important, just like uh, the idea of a self-portrait. Individuals are important. They have that idea. but they're going to try to infuse the idea of people are important with Christianity and then try to infuse that onto the society. So there's a big emphasis on social change. How do we make society better for the humans that live there? How can we empower people to make our society a better place? And with that, you know, one thing they, they decide is that education is a good way to do that. So one person that you should take note of is William Shakespeare. Now, whether or not he actually wrote his pieces, um, can be debated, I suppose. Um, at, at very least, he definitely stole a lot of the ideas behind them. Uh, but he did a lot of work in sharing a lot of information with everybody else. So this is a recreation in London of the Globe Theater. And you can see here, this is a stage. And if you were common, you could still be educated. You could still hear these plays. You could still be entertained in that way. And the plays were secular for the most part, which is a major change. Up to this point, plays were mostly morality plays, where they would teach you how to live a good life and what's going to happen at the final judgment and the idea of heaven versus hell and the Christian church. Now, Shakespeare comes in and says, no, let's, let's have a comedy. Let's have a tragedy with star-crossed lovers. And if you were poor, you could stand up and watch the play. If you were rich, you could sit along the edge. And everybody could be involved. Another major feature is something called the movable type printing press, created by a, a guy named Gutenberg. And this is a huge development. Um, before this time, we had monks that would write everything out longhand. And now you can set all the type in a way, put ink down, put your paper on top of it, and print the same page again and again, so much easier than before. So to close things up, a few changes in the arts. First of all, they, they drew on the styles of classical Greece and Rome. Uh, they portrayed things very lifelike and nature in a very lifelike way. Uh, the artists created works that were secular and religious, but secular is important. And writers started to use the vernacular language to express their ideas. A vernacular language is the language in which the common people spoke. And the arts praised individual achievements. 
And also, the last few ch changes in society, take a look through these as well and jot them down on your paper. Thank you.